Welcome to the Personal Pension Radio Podcast, where it's all about helping you complete your financial journey to retirement. Discover time-tested strategies and get unconventional insights into wealth building and retirement that actually work. Break away from the herd and go for the retirement you dream of. And now, here's your host, the income engineer, Craig Strom. All right, back on Personal Pension Radio, episode number 182. That is amazing, 182. Thank you so much for the support on this show. I really appreciate the emails, the questions that come in. I appreciate the shares. I appreciate the uh, the nice things on iTunes and the comments that have been left there. Thank you so much. If you haven't gone over and actually left a comment on uh, the iTunes, a review, that would be phenomenal. I would greatly appreciate it. And yes, I am the income engineer broadcasting from the Personal Pension Radio Workshop here in Southern California. Loving it. This is the time of year. I'm recording this in October. Finally, California for me starts to actually feel like uh, the weather that... I like. I love it when it gets kind of cold, rainy, awesome. Now, my mission, and I have chosen to accept it, hence the income engineer title, I really love the conversation around that retirement dream that Wall Street always promised, but never really gave people, the compl- and even people like me, but never gave the general public the complete picture on how to achieve that, air quotes, retirement dream. Well, for me, the retirement dream is fueled by income. Whatever your desired lifestyle is, in retirement or after you exit a job or exit a business, whatever you call retirement, well, your activity is fueled by income. And the retirement income conversation is something that was completely lacking in my early education as a financial advisor. And unfortunately, it's just not advantageous for Wall Street to teach financial advisors how to teach the general public to take money out of the Wall Street system, right? That's what it's all about. Income is really how do we take money out of the cash cow, if you will, that is Wall Street. And there's no financial incentive for Wall Street to teach it. Therefore, there's not as much as there needs to be in the terms of education regarding retirement income planning. That's where my specialty and my passion lies. Retirement income planning, pre-retirement and post-retirement. Absolutely. Most advisors have been educated by that same machine that taught me. And I'm here to tell you folks, it is incomplete. Incomplete. Retirement income planning, maximum retirement income planning is not a product It doesn't happen with Roth IRAs. It doesn't happen with life insurance. It doesn't happen with investments. They all need to be coordinated together for a maximum lifestyle income outcome, right? Income outcome. Nice little play on words there. This show, my my hope is to give you hope and perspective on retirement to let you know that it's entirely possible. Had a conversation recently with some folks who just weren't sure whether or not they could actually exit and and have the lifestyle they wanted. And I'm here to tell them next week on our next phone call after I get back from my travels abroad, they can do it. They can actually exit perhaps even sooner than they thought, right? That's the idea. That's what I want you to know is the light at the end of the retirement tunnel can be turned on, right? You've just got to be willing to stop following the conventional wisdom. Remember, conventional wisdom is that uh, things like the Wall Street message. Wall Street controls the marketing machine that dictates what conventional wisdom is in regards to retirement. I'm here to tell you, you've got to be willing to step out of that line Ask questions, learn something from a different perspective, and you will absolutely benefit. You will benefit from that. Now, quick disclosure, I am not an attorney. I am not a certified public accountant, but I am a certified financial planner professional. And as qualified as this cool microphone and this setup on my studio, my studio here sounds, 
as much as it makes me sound qualified, please don't act on things that you hear on my show or any other show, especially from financial entertainers like Dave Ramsey, who has no license, no regulation to give out financial advice. Please don't act on things that you hear on these kinds of shows or channels or on the Google machine. Please meet with a qualified financial planner. And I would love that financial planner to be me. I meet with folks all over the country through the miracles of technology. I have face-to-face conversations with folks as far away as New Jersey, New York, Miami, right? All the way to Maine. Please meet with a qualified financial planner. And if you'd like that planner to be me, if you want to give me an opportunity to be on your team, you can send me an email, Craig with a K at craigstrom, S-T-R-O-M dot com. Craig at craigstrom dot com. Now, I'm going to start off with a deal of the week, right? So uh, if you're new to the show, I am all about lifestyle deflation, the quest for lifestyle deflation, finding ways to enjoy life without necessarily paying full-blown retail. I just can't stand paying retail. And nowadays, with the technology at hand and so many cool services like the one I'm going to mention today, there's no reason to just flat out just pay retail, right? I've got to say how much I love Airbnb and Airbnb type services. These things have come up now in this time, this day and age that we have the ability to do this with our cars, with our recreational vehicles. We can do this with our homes, with rental properties and things like that. I just love how I'm able to plan a trip. So you heard me say earlier, I'm traveling abroad, not really leaving the country, but I'm leaving the state of California tomorrow morning and I'm flying to Tampa, Florida flying to Tampa, Florida, where I will be staying because it's such a quick little trip. I'm going to be staying in a hotel near the airport for one night. And then I fly to Miami for a real estate investment conference that I'll be at. I'm going to be uh, moderating a panel discussion on self-directed IRAs and 401ks and Roths. If you don't know what a self-directed 401k or IRA is, Oh my gosh, you need to learn that. If you've ever wanted to know about it, send me an email, craig at craigstrom.com. I love to talk to you about it, but here's what's going on. I'm flying into Tampa. I'll be meeting with a couple of CPAs who are interested in partnering with my firm and looking forward to that. Then I'm flying into Miami. Now in Miami, I'm going to be staying there for a couple of days. So I got on airbnb.com. And I then got on the hotel website where the conference is. So I'm going to be at this conference doing a panel discussion. So maybe I should look at at least how much does it cost to stay at the hotel where the conference is? Well, the hotel is $309 a night minimum. That's the least expensive room I could find at the hotel. $309 a night in Miami, I guess that's pretty standard for a fancy schmancy hotel. Now, I found an Airbnb top floor in a uh, kind of a hotel condo setup. Nice place. I've seen all the pictures and such, right? And that with taxes and fees and everything included was $113 a night. It's a nine minute walk from the conference and it's 64% less expensive. 64% less expensive for renting a bed effectively, right? That's what you're doing when you go to a hotel. Because if you're going to a hotel in a place like Miami, the hotel is not the destination. Miami Beach is the destination, or in my case, this conference is the destination. So you're essentially renting a bed that you can use when you're not out at the destination. So in my case, I got a bed rental for 64% less, and it took me all of about five minutes. Five minutes, folks, and it's nine minutes beautiful walk down the same exact street 
that the conference hotel is on. It's not on some street, hang a left, turn right, go down a half a block, and then walk a mile. It's literally on the same street, nine minutes away. Beautiful walk, early in the morning. I'm looking forward to it. And I did the same thing because from Miami, I fly into New York City. I'm taking my first trip to New York City and got an Airbnb in Lower Manhattan. You can imagine that in Lower Manhattan, near the Time Warner building, where I'm going to be meeting with a law firm who would like to partner with our firm, you can imagine that hotels are really expensive. Well, I got a great deal on an Airbnb in Lower Manhattan. So that becomes my point of, you know, just starting point for whatever I'm going to do for a few days in New York, right? Airbnb, awesome. If you haven't checked it out, fantastic. Now, let's get into the Watch Your Step segment. In the last episode, I want you to go back and listen to it if you're interested, but beware, please, 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 beware of negative comments about cash on hand, especially when you hear what I'm saying in this next segment where we're going to talk about uh, or this next warning that I have for you, which is the signs are out there that the bull rush, the bull market is coming to an end. And I'm hearing it on the internal channels, magazines and internal financial planning publications and such, you know, prepare your clients for the end of the bull market, that kind of stuff. But the general public is not necessarily hearing the same things that I'm hearing inside the financial world. So last week, I talked about beware of, of advisors who are negative about you keeping large amounts of cash on hand. Go back and listen to that because cash on hand is a power play when the world falls apart market-wise, investments are on sale, right? So this week, signs are out there, right? The signs of the end is near, right? Those signs are out there all over the place, but you've got to ask yourself, is your financial advisor telling you about them? Is your financial advisor warning you about the impending fall of the bull, right? Maybe not, but I'm telling you that multiple times in the last few weeks, me personally, I'm a certified financial planner professional. I'm also an investment advisor, representative, yada, 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 all those things. But for me personally, in the last few weeks, I have noticed air quotes, the end is near as a theme in my industry insider communications. I'm not suggesting insider trading. I'm suggesting these are publications that come to investment advisors and financial planners and such. Okay. I'm seeing that end is near kind of thing messaged multiple times. Now today, even as I prepare for this podcast, I read one magazine, one of many, but one magazine, Financial Advisor Magazine, containing multiple references to the end of the bull market. In the singular publication, there was one of these articles that said, preparing for a rainy day was the one that stopped me cold. And I said, well, you know what? This is definitely going to be a watch your step moment on the podcast, right? Wall Street will have a ton of Wall Street options available for the end of the bull run conversation. But is there something outside of the usual basket of investments approach? Is there something, remember conventional wisdom, right? Wall Street's conventional wisdom is always going to benefit who? Wall Street. So if you're sitting on a phenomenal track record over the last five, six, seven, eight years, and it's all been in that Wall Street machine, good for you. But the end is coming, right? This bull market cannot last forever. How are you preparing for the rainy day? Well, if you're preparing for the rainy day by consulting with the same Wall Street machine where you have earned the great return over the last several years, guess what? You're going to get conventional advice. You've got to talk to someone who is not afraid of true 
diversification. True diversification is achieved when you don't have a bunch of stuff that will all move in the same direction when the bull stumbles, right? Now, it is argued consistently that, oh, you can create true diversification all within a Wall Street investment firm environment. I would argue no. No, you can't. Because there are things, for example, like uh, outside in the guaranteed annuity world, right? You've got annuities. You've got life insurance. You've got real estate. You've got real estate-related investments. You've got financial vehicles that are outside the typical Wall Street machine that are available that can provide true diversification in many cases, the financial advisor or financial planners at the Wall Street firms are not going to mention those outside options because they're just not part of the menu that they are allowed to talk about. That's just the case, folks. You've got to talk to a financial planner who is able to work in all spectrums of true diversification. And that's something that I pride myself in. I am not captive to one particular direction when it comes to building a portfolio that is truly diversified. If you'd like to know more, right? If you would like to really get ready for that rainy day, start with a free portfolio risk analysis. Send me an email, craig at craigstrom.com, and I'll send you back a free portfolio risk analysis. You can start by getting your own risk profile, and then you can plug in your investment portfolio to find out if it matches up, right? Knowing your current risk profile and now then being sure that everything checks out will help you go forward, right? And if you need help figuring it all out, I am your guy. I would love to help with that, right? I am extremely passionate about this, but I am telling you, now is the time. It is truly the time. You better get ready for that rainy day. Don't get blindsided again like 2008, right? Don't get blindsided again. Let's get ready together. I'm here to help on that, so please. Now, uh, jumping in, segment two, this is listener questions and my personal observations this week, uh, and we'll kind of jump in there. Now, in the last episode, I covered just a couple of quick things. One, somebody had asked me what the logo means on my podcast and uh, went over that. And, and whatever happened to buying the clearance supercar? Well, quick update on that. Um, the transaction looks like it's going to go through this next week. Uh, that actually I helped a friend uh, find a clearance supercar for a huge discount, a huge discount, love depreciation, never buy a new car. And in the supercar world, that is so much more true than I think anywhere else. And it's college season. Don't forget, check that out. I've compiled a list of resources to help you with college and college planning. If you really would like some information on it, send me an email, craig at craigstrom.com, and I'll send you back. Uh, you just in your subject line, just write college. I'll send you back my document that I've compiled a lot of resources that are just easily found, and they're free, mostly free, to be able to go get those. Now, this week, okay, this week, thank you to Grant and Aaron for a real estate geek question. I am a real estate and investment analysis geek. I love to analyze this stuff, right? And the question really is, does it make more sense to pay cash for a rental property in a Cincinnati, Ohio suburb or get a loan, right? So I, I love those kind of questions. So I went and found a four unit, four unit property in a Cincinnati, Ohio suburb for $150,000, a four unit in Cincinnati built in 1929. Okay. The rent on the four units, currently all four units are rented out. Total rent is $1,610 a month. So assuming a 2% increase in the value of this thing, this property, year by year for the next five years, right? And assuming 
$450 a month in maintenance and miscellaneous expenses. Now, I don't know if that's right or not, but I, I think it might be kind of high for a $150,000 property, but let's just see what it looks like, right? So this is what I like to do. I like to start off with the Dave Ramsey approach, which is pay cash for the property. Just pay cash because everybody has $154,000 sitting around. You say, well, wait a minute. I thought it was $150,000. Yeah, but I threw in closing costs. Oh, I forgot to put in sales tax. Darn it. But let's just say it's $154,500. And if you pay cash and you hold that property for five years, collecting $1,600 a month, you would have a rate of return. Cash is what we paid, remember? And you sell the property, your rate of return is about 8%. Now, that's not bad. That's not bad at all. I mean, 8% on a property, but you, you had to tie up $154,000 for five years, right? So, 8%. Remember that. Cash equals 8% rate of return over that five years. Now, what if we go the conventional route, right? So the conventional route is let's just go get a bank loan. Let's go to a bank and we got to put 20% down. So we got to put 30 grand down, right? So we get a loan and we finance some additional expenses in there, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we put our, we get our loan, right? And as we're going through this, let's say we get a loan interest rate of 4.5%. So with that 4.5%, you get a $608 a month payment, right? So you get $608 a month in a payment. Remember, what was our cash on cash rate of return? 8.3%, 0.03, 8%. Right. And then we got a loan for 120,000 bucks, right? Four and a half percent, 30 year loan, $608 a month. The rate of return on the same exact property now that we use the bank's money to buy it is 17.45%, over 17% rate of return on the same property. Now, wait a minute, it gets even better, right? 17%. What if? What if we could go out and we could get another loan for some of the down payment? What if we could get a loan for some of the down payment, right? Because we had to put money into the property, cash, right? Because when we paid cash, we got a return of 8.3%, right? Clearly, cash at 8.3 or 3% versus 17, yeah. Every time we put cash in, obviously our rate of return goes down. So what would happen if we could go to another lender, another lender, and get the money for the down payment? What if we could get $30,000 from a life insurance company or an investment company because we were holding collateral in one of those places, right? So what if we had money in collateral at an investment company or at a life insurance company, we could borrow from the investment company or we could borrow from the life insurance company using our money as collateral. So what if we could go get another loan for the down payment and we got our $30,000 loan from the down payment and what if we paid for it just like a regular 30 year loan? right? Guess what the rate of return goes to? Remember, let's go through the steps because this is kind of blow your mind kind of stuff. We were sitting at a cash purchase for a property, 8% return. We went and got a standard bank loan to buy that investment property. And our rate of return went up to over 17%. Now, what if we go get that Second loan, using our account as collateral, the rate of return jumps up on this little property in Cincinnati to 53%. 53% rate of return because we used other people's money. Paying cash cost 
a huge amount of money when it comes to buying an investment, specifically investment real estate. Paying cash is very costly. It's a costly mistake. Paying cash is one of the worst ways to buy rental property, especially. Now, a quick lesson in rate of return for any investment. You only earn a rate of return on the investment itself. You do not earn a rate of return on the investment itself, whether it be a, uh, a piece of real estate or some other kind of investment. You don't earn a rate of return on the real estate and a rate of return on the cash used to acquire the real estate. The cash you used to acquire the asset does not earn a rate of return. The cash is tied up in an investment and earns zero while it is holding the investment for you, right? So what if you could control the asset, in this case, a four-unit property in Cincinnati, what if you could control the asset with someone else's money, in this case, let's say a bank's money, and a life insurance company's money, and leave your money to earn a rate of return as well? What if you could earn a rate of return on the money that was used for that collateral loan? Ah, that's the magic. Folks, that is where collateral lending gets its true power, is that you're able to borrow other people's money and leave your money to earn a rate of return. So now, not just taking it from an 8% to a 17% to a 53% return, now if you factor in, remember, we use that other loan, to get $30,000, your, in your case, let's say you're doing this with a life insurance company, your $30,000 is still earning a rate of return in, let's say, a life insurance contract. Well, how much does that change the rate of return? When we look at the $30,000 at a very modest 3% appreciation rate, Let's just say it's earning 3%, super conservative, nothing outlandish. That's almost $80 a month in growth over five years. When you factor that in on top of the numbers we already had, we go from an 8% cash to 17.5% with a bank loan to over 50% with a collateral loan. And now you jump all the way to nearly 70% return when you factor in your cash actually still earning a rate of return. Your collateral appreciates in value because you did not tie it up inside the real estate. Folks, the smart money right? The smart money when it comes to buying rental properties or any good investment is to try and use someone else's money to acquire it. Those are my three rules of investments. Three rules. Number one, buy it cheap. Number two, buy it with someone else's money if possible. And number three, in a good market in a good area. If it's real estate, that's a location. Great. But my point, folks, is that Dave Ramsey says that debt is dumb. Well, I would su I suggest this. Bad debt is dumb. Bad debt is definitely something you want to avoid. Credit card debt on a TV, credit card debt on, you know, a, a restaurant dinner or something that you're not paying off on a dinner that you bought 2 years ago. That's bad debt. Properly structured debt on a real estate purchase, that's good debt. And in, in reality, if you have equity in the property, you're not actually in debt. You're in a positive equity position. You have a liability on the investment, but you're not in debt. Debt is when you owe more than the investment or the asset is worth. You're in debt. 
if you have equity in the asset you've invested in because you followed rule number one, get a good investment, right? You have a liability outstanding on that asset, but you're not in debt when you are in an equity position. So folks, just as a recap, we went on this four unit, inexpensive, gosh, I almost want to fly to Cincinnati and buy some properties. My goodness, $150,000 for a uh, four unit property with $1,600 a month coming in. That's crazy good. That is so cool. So 8% return for cash purchase. Go get a regular, con you know, regular conventional loan. Now we go up from eight to 17, call it 17 and a half percent return. Then we go out and we get a collateral loan. The collateral loan, let's say, is uh, amortized over the same period of time. Now we jump up to over 50% rate of return, 50%. And when you add in the fact that the money that you still had in the collateral account is earning a rate of return, you're pushing almost 80% or almost 70% overall rate of return, 70% from an 8%. I don't know about you folks, but in this case, bigger is better. Bigger is better, right? That's a little quick lesson. Grant and Aaron, thank you so much for this question. I get excited about this stuff. Uh, now I might need to change my flight on the way back and uh, drop into Cincinnati, huh? There's so many different options like this that are all around the, the country. Now, folks, if you've been inspired by this, if you listen to this and thought, hey, I want to learn more about that collateral lending and how do I set up one of those investment accounts or life insurance accounts that does that? I love it. I'm an expert at it. Send me an email. Craig at CraigStrom.com. Craig with a K, K-R-A-I-G at CraigStrom.com. Now, quick reminder, if you want to find out what your risk profile looks like and whether your current investment portfolio fits and matches your risk profile, send me an email. I'll give you back the link so you can plug in and do your own risk analysis, and I'll even help if you want. And also, that ties into something that I haven't offered and put out in a while. If you would like to have access to eMoney, just a phenomenal cash flow planning, estate planning, advanced planning aggregation tool. It's like mint.com on steroids. If you would like to have free access to eMoney, send me an email, craig at craigstrom.com, subject line eMoney. I'll send you back a link to eMoney. Now, folks, that's going to wrap it up. Please keep those awesome questions coming. I appreciate, always, always appreciate the feedback, and I look forward to doing this again real soon. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Personal Pension Radio podcast. We took notes for you, so if you missed any part of the show, you can find a full transcript of each episode at personalpensionradio.com. Be sure to download your free retirement income crisis report at personalpensionradio.com. While you're at it, we would appreciate some iTunes love. Please leave us a fantastic rating on iTunes by going to personalpensionradio forward slash iTunes. Thanks again for listening. Now for the disclosure. <clears throat> Information presented is for educational purposes only and is not intended for solicitation, sale or purchase of any security or financial product. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor and your tax professional before implementing any strategy discussed here. The term personal pension refers to a marketing name designed to educate future retirees and retirees about the economic principles behind creating their own pension like income. The term personal pension is not intended to be confused with a defined benefit pension plan offered by an employer or by a government entity.